the other albums are great, but as the, for me personally, the other albums had a couple of tracks that I was never that into. Whereas this from your funeral, my trial was, uh, a, you know, uh, a much more whole album. That was most definitely the most fractured of all the records. The band was in a very strange place. Uh, Thomas had come in to play drums. He sprained his wrist. He had an accident. He fell out of his bed, which was like first floor. And he went through the window and cut his arm and he couldn't drum. So I have, I think I have a really nice video of, of him not being able to drum. So he just uses his left hand because his right hand is in bandage. And then he just has to play a fire extinguisher because I went to the Hansa studio trying to find an object that has the right note. And I found that fire extinguisher. So he just sits there counting, 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 tonk, and hit the uh, fire extinguisher. So Mick had to take over all the drumming. Barry wasn't playing on it. Uh, and then he played on a couple of tracks. I left the Bad Seeds and I felt that my time was done. You know, I'd, I'd gone through the whole, as we call it in my band, sort of dead man walking phase. So that left me, Nick and Blixer. And, and Nick was wary of playing instruments because he was still just... His mind was, you know, he just could, didn't concentrate. He didn't seem to be able to concentrate at the time. And Blixer uh, just played what Blixer plays, which is very specifically, you know, the, that kind of guitar Blixer plays. So for some reason, a lot of the basic tracks I had to kind of construct. Blixer was present and then not present for huge parts of it. Nick was going through a very dark period in his life. You can see it in the, in the credits that, you know, I'm, I'm just playing far too many instruments on some of those songs. And uh, some of them were built up from one instrument and um, for better or worse, a lot of it's me. Suddenly these incredible songs appeared like um, Sad Waters and Your Funeral, My Trial, um, these incredible kind of, you know, love songs that... that um, it just seemed like there was, after the albums that had been on before and then there was suddenly that album, it was like, God, you know, what, I mean, what can't they do? It's a transition towards that sort of more personal, confessional, uh, heartfelt um, approach of writing songs. And I think a lot of people who start playing punk rock or doing something countercultural face this challenge inside of themselves at some point. You know, what if I tried not to be weird? You know, what if I... What if I wrote something that, you know, that normal people might enjoy, not just those of us who dress funny and stay up late? One of my favorite songs is, it's off um, your funeral, my trial, it's called Sad Waters. Um, to me, that seems like a early example of, of Nick's later preoccupations. You know, like it's a really, it's like a, it's a real landmark, that song, I think, in particular, in his career, because it has, you know, it has God, it has love, it has the prison, it has the, you know, the fantastical mixed with the absurd and the irrational, and it has, you know, that profound uh, sorrow that just is um, instilled in in Nick's songwriting. You know, it's got that kind of, yeah, that it's just got that way, it's got a real down feeling. It has a, a haunting ghost ghost vocal, which is kind of in the background. It's almost, it's almost like the front vocal is a, an afterthought. From the second it starts, that song just cracks my heart open. Um, that, that, you know, disarmed, um, stripped down um, until that last line. Well, the vinyl just has a, this beautiful warmth to it and um, with the production, that kind of sparse production with the organ cutting through, it just lends itself to a fantastic kind of sound. That movement from description into simple past tense to the then she played it is a really clever and nice and invisible piece of writing. Right, that it doesn't come at you the way that 
you know, that lesser craftsmen like myself are going to, you know, you will maybe see us at work and you'll go, oh, I'm supposed to notice that that's good writing. And that's, you fail if people notice that, that you're trying to write well. The idea is to sound like you're not writing at all. The idea is to sound like this just emerged from you. You know, Nick, Nick sort of Nick sort of supplied everything that I wanted a rock star to be. It's not, it's not so much the sensationalism and the danger. It's it's actually his ability to write um, that's always impressed me. Like right from back, right from the first time that I was exposed to them, it was his writing. In the town where I lived, there was one really cool bar, and we would, me and my younger sister, would always go there, and um, we. The, there was something very interesting about this bar, which we thought it was normal because we always used to go there. They had a DJ playing music every night, although there wasn't even a dance floor. And the, the most interesting thing about that was that the DJ, whenever he played a song, he would put the album sleeve in front of the turntable so that everyone could see what was playing. It's strange because my sister and I, we grew up in Mexico City, but we were always like Anglophiles and a lot of the, most of the music we were listening to was always from England or Australia or Scotland or sort of that part of the world. This is how I got to know Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds in 1986 when I think they were playing um, Your Funeral My Trial. You know when you're a teenager and the music you're listening to is it's and the books you're reading and those are the things that define you at that point. You That's what you're shaping your identity. Um, I remember listening to this album like 10 times a day or something, you know, it was, we just loved it. A friend of mine in Mexico City had a cassette of Your Funeral, My Child, and I borrowed it from her and I never gave it back. I still have it. This is probably in 1987. I was 12 or 13. And um, I remember listening to it for the first time in my bedroom sort of lying on the floor with my eyes closed. You know, I was into other bands like Joy Division and Gang of Four and Wire and this and that, you know. But the Bad Seeds were like the first band that sort of scared the living daylights out of me. I suppose the amazing thing about music is that sometimes it's just scary and it's, you don't know why it's so unnerving and so strange. The track, The Carney, for me, is, is all my kind of nightmares rolled into one. It's things that you know, really freak you out, like ventriloquist dummies, freak shows, sideshow. And it's, again, the band used this repetitive motif, the organ part, which is just, it's, it's just, I find it very disturbing, that track. I love the imagery that he'd got these two biblical figures, gigantic biblical figures, you know, Noah who saves the planet pre-global warming, and um, Moses who parts the Red Sea, and he makes some dwarves. Found that hilarious. I was, you know, I was raised Haitian Catholic or French West Indian Catholic. Can't get stricter than that. And that that sort of subtle blasphemy, I, I enjoyed that. Mick started off, walked in with the guts of a piano, a uh, grand piano, and said, "Okay, well, I've got the chords of the song. I think I know how it goes." And we just record him just plucking one string and then another string and then another string and then adding a couple of things. I mean, that, that was there, and I think we you know, had to kind of mark out where all the, you know, because it's just a piano frame, so I had some I had some kind of things that I was plucking the thing with. And um, it was probably doubled, so, um, which meant I did it all twice, uh, to state the bleeding obvious. And um, I probably just varied the timing a bit so it wasn't, because it was to a click track, I suppose, to make it kind of, just, you know, flop around a bit more and be a little less regimented, I just kind of varied the timing internally or whatever, just worked against the click track a bit to have it kind of floating around and swooning or whatever. The, the weird piano rhythms, this disharmonic uh, moments, uh, yeah, it's... I mean, it's amazing. It has an incredible tension, the song. So. Nick must have played some of the basic track and sort of laid it out because it's all inconsistent lengths. I think 
the Kani was very much a, a, a mind, uh, Nick's mind child. He already knew what, what this is going to be. It was a layering of different melodies and different uh, different things coming together. And I just happened to be able to contribute the dying horse on a guitar. There's a Carney who leaves and the other performers are kind of waiting to see if he'll come back and he doesn't and then the caravan moves on and the Carney left behind this emaciated horse which they then bury named Sorrow. The dwarves, you know, dig a, a grave for it and then after the, the sideshow leaves, the rain comes and um, the horse's corpse kind of comes up to the surface and the crows come and eat it. Lyrically, Nick kept sort of um, going down, expanding uh, with with um, kind of characters and forming these other worlds. Um, and what was, I think, so great about a lot of these worlds is that, that he made them so vivid and the band musically made them so kind of distinct that you could really um, lose yourself in it. You can actually see the mud, you know, and the wagon wheels sticking in the mud and stuff. It's just so um, exactly illustrated in lyric. You know, they develop your visual imagination because it's not like growing up uh, when you're watching television or, or even films where you're given the, the images. You know, you're just, you're, the images are being described and you have to visualize them in your head, so I think you know, as a filmmaker, it was very good training for me. A very funny thing happened actually during that, during the mixing of that song, is that um, as a kind of arrangemental device, we decided to switch a few things off in this particular passage in the song, where it breaks down to just the bass and the uh, the vibraphone, I think, and um, it revealed this hidden verse that Nick had sung. <laughs> which we didn't know was there. It's dark. I mean, the carny is so... It's a nightmare. Um, I think here you have to... Mick Harvey here, spectacular, you know, with what he's coming up with. Nick hadn't bothered telling us that we couldn't hear that verse. He'd never mentioned it. He just, I think he just hoped that it was buried and no one had noticed because maybe he didn't even care about it or something. But uh, so maybe he just thought we'd switched it off because we thought it was rubbish or who knows. He didn't say anything about it anyway and then it suddenly, there it was. You know, I remember hearing Your Funeral, My Child, that, that song, and it was just so haunting and beautiful, like this lamentation. Um, and at the time, um, at school, I didn't have very many friends and I just spent my time kind of writing and reading and listening to my Walkman. And I'd listen to that record, that tape at school. This was a lot of our, a lot of my, uh, my late night world would be spent, you know, I, ha I was had to go to class the next day and I'm listening to, you know, broadcasts of music that from l different lands, you know, like Australia and England and France and all over the place. So this was like a static, signal to me that that uh it was almost like a rallying cry you know um i i mean it's i make it sound so dramatic but it it uh you know music anyone who really really loves music will know what i'm talking about or really loves cinema or or whatever you know and it was like artists like nick cave and tom waits that first that opened that world to me the friend that I borrowed that cassette from in 1987, um, she actually uh, had a very tragic death a few years ago. She had become a, a very uh, bad addict, of, a heroin and crack addict, and she was going out with a drug dealer and she was murdered. So now that record also uh, reminds me of her. From the opening piano notes of, of the, the title song, Your Funeral, My Trial, I, it's, it's almost like the tension just goes out of your neck, and I can't not pay attention to the music. The thing that strikes me most is this, it was at a period where pop music was, it was at its worst, you know. <laughs> oh, it was horrible. It was um, Mr. Mr. and uh, Whitney Houston and nonsense. It was just ugly, ugly. And Nick kind of embarked on this project which stripped everything back and kind of eschewed that overproduced ugliness that was so prevalent and 
crafted these wonderful kind of piano based and very sentimental songs uh, that, that were profound and moving in their simplicity. It's good music to listen to with your eyes closed because you, there's so many images that you want to visualize and you don't want to be sort of distracted by things in front of you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really powerful and it, it was a real shift from everything that people were doing at that time. For me, that album, I can hear it in the grooves. Probably anyone else just thinks it's quite a dark album. But I can hear that that album is drenched in uh, heroin. <laughs> I mean, it's... You think you're functioning normally, and you are, if you've got some, but I can hear it in the voice. He's wrenching everything out of his soul, and that's why I like it. It's a realistic... To me, that's a proper blues album. He, he was bringing those tracks like Sad Waters and Your Funeral, My Trial were coming out of his soul. I think Your Funeral, My Trial still for me is probably my, my favourite Bad Seeds um, album. The, uh, the sound of that, that, that record is just, I think it's one of the, the best of why well, they released it on these two 45s. Because the album was divided into two sort of separate sections. I mean, you can't tell on the CD, unfortunately, but it's going back to vinyl. Um, but there was a water motif in, in all the songs on your funeral, my trial, uh, you know, there's tears for funeral and you know, rain in the carney and the river in, uh, sad waters and keys raining like, uh, yeah, keys falling like rain in stranger than kindness. I think I can't remember the lyric too well, but, uh, and then there was the, the kind of aggressive trial in prison motif on the trial side. Vinyl was still it, it the CDs did not really matter at that point. So I don't know if they were even widely available, but uh, at that point it was, the idea was to make a double 45 12 inch. Means two album, two long player sized records that run in 45 rotations per minute. The A side, is a complete entity for me. And then you had to change over to the B side. And that's another complete entity for me in my memory or in my feeling towards the album. It's not split up into individual songs, but it's like the album as is, is one big piece of music, which I love and still consider probably my favorite Nick Cave and the Bad Seas record. And there was a song, Stranger Than Kindness. And, um, and I was, in one way, uh, I realized I like it and I was frightened. I was frightened because I realized I like this kind of music, um, this kind of um, really dark, uh, sad, and it needs to be said, uh, especially about that song, um, seductive music. I had listened to that song many times and it didn't really, didn't, it didn't resonate with me the way other ones did. It was sort of this very sad sounding song that was in the background for me. I like the lyrics a lot. I think it, it sums up. I don't know. I don't, I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's not about having an affair, but it, it seemed to me that it was. And I really liked the way it, it talked about that. The bottled light from hotels, um, you, you know, there's a visuality to it, which, which I respond to very strongly because he is able to touch on so many of those dark moments that we, we kind of, if we haven't experienced ourselves, we're, we're aware of it. It's so sad. The idea of being a stranger to kind, kindness, it's what a tragically sad sentiment and I never heard it until I saw them for the first time. And um, that's what I remember most about that night. I don't know who of the bad seats was present in Berlin at the time, but I remember quite clearly that at some point it was only Nick and me rehearsing in there. 
And that's when the Stranger in Kindness started. I played something and Nick asked, is that something? And I said, yeah, could be. And then um, that's how it started. Blixer worked on his guitar sound uh, for hours to make this great sound of this special guitar, of this track, yeah? I never play with uh, a plectrum. I always play with my fingers. And in that case, I was playing with my, with all four fingers. Like, so it's, I play, I, I basically file my fingernails on the strings. Exactly. As is many, many, many tracks uh, with, with a technique, like a propeller. Going like a... And uh, then, of course, with the uh, miracles of modern technology, you layer these, uh, and you have several layers of these, and then, then it sounds quite... Uh, nebulous. I really felt um, the influence of Berlin somehow. I was really, I really could see it in that. And I don't know if it was a, a influence of Neubauten or just Berlin in general, and a certain sound. It was funny, but for me, it's the, your funeral is much more uh, Berlin in its whole, in its history. It's, um, yeah. When I talk about Berlin in 1986, I talk about a city that I saw with the eyes of a, of a stranger because I wasn't born here, I didn't live here. I came there to, to visit my friends. And so I have a very romantic memory of this town, especially for its cultural scene and especially within this cultural scene of the subculture of the underground from an outside look maybe it was like in um, a big zoo because there was this wall around a uh, big fence and you couldn't get lost so you could get lost as much as you could because you finally couldn't get lost berlin had this aura about it which lent itself to that sort of like excessiveness. To be honest, I can't remember much of that time because um, we all lived too fast, you know? It just kind of just like rubbed off into the music, you know, you kind of like, they knew they could be really free here, I think, rather than having to play to some kind of like conformity. I mean, they never really were conform anyway, but, you know, I think that, I think the fact that, the, that Berlin was a very, very free and open city and it seemed to be like there was no rules here or anything. And even when the wall actually did come down, there were definitely no more rules here. Um, I think that really kind of like lent itself into the into the sound of the so songs, especially, you know, when you see like them recording at the Hansa studio. When I'm thinking back now, this is just unbelievable. This 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 paradise situation. You have this Nazi ballroom. <laughs> Not about the Nazis. I mean the ballroom, no, from the sound, <laughs> and that was that was great too. That room, it's in itself was an instrument, and it had this uh, um, beautiful old like radio uh, analog equipment in there, and uh, and just the whole atmosphere of the place. Um, it's very profound. Well, I guess, you know, an important thing was not to want to belong to the rock world. Um, and I mean, I don't really know, you know, what, what, what other people, you know, had in the back of their heads. But for us, I, can, I could say that we weren't thinking about a career or, or anything. That was just not the point. Um, we just tried to... Um, you know, develop some kind of what we considered radical approach to things, um, you know, to, to kind of widen what, you know, was to be considered or to be called music. We had a good net, we still have that, but at that time, a very close network of exchanging ideas, styles, I don't know, I can't, I, I can't, um, yeah, music, clothes, uh, style, uh, and, and uh, I don't know, um, a, um, also 
also the influence of so many music styles. You know, people came, I came with country and rockabilly, then other people came with um, industrial sound, whatever. And we all listened in the end to the same, to the same stuff, but one more that kind of music, the other one more that kind of music, but we, but we, um, um, widened our, our horizon constantly. You know, I had this Alan Lomax record that was uh, these guys, you know, the chain gangs, you know, hitting the rocks, singing. And Nick was into all of that sort of stuff himself and had, um, abs you know, the world of the, uh, the deep south and the blues and all this kind of stuff. He had his own uh, fictitious way of interpreting this stuff. And so... A lot of that did involve crime and violence and prison. I, I guess he had a prison obsession at that time. He was doing the, the prison film with uh, Hugo Rice and Blixer. Some of this stuff we were working on came, drew on that. And then uh, some of it also spilled out into songs like Knocking on Joe and later Jack's Shadow is in fact... Uh, referring to Jack Henry Abbott. And, and we actually created this character, Jack, in the film. Jack Shadows, oh, it's absolute genius. I love it. And um, I think, I'm sure it's Blixer. I'm, I, it's just this crazy guitar piece that is so edgy and aggressive and disturbing. And, you know, you feel like uh, this, I mean, it's overtly about this guy has been kicked out of prison, the hole that he's been thrown out of, and he can't deal with the sun and he can't deal with this new society that he's thrown into. Um, and the guitar absolutely reflects that, you know. It's the, the song that I can go back to over and over again on that album. Jack Shadow, I remember from this record, it's great to one of the last songs I played with Barry together before he left. You know, it was about the, at the time of your funeral, my trial, and Barry uh, left the group and they were looking for, Mick was going to switch over to um, bass. And so I, uh, he asked me to come in and play guitar. And um, it was, and um, for a tour, just for a, a few, few dates. Being in Nick Cave and the Bad Seas was probably one of the most crucial things in my life. And, and I, you know, and I, I say that sort of, you know, uh, not with any irony or, or anything, because it's really it, it informed such a lot of my uh, uh, work uh, today. You know, I mean, that I I feel that I only aspire, <laughs> if you like, to some of the things that were going on at the time I was in that band and the level of. Uh, of creation, of getting to a, a way to be able to create. For me, your funeral, my trial, um, is very uh, important to me, and very, um, and very, uh, yeah, very important and very dear to me because it, it, I really see that as a start of another chapter, and not only in music but in my life. It ended up being not too many ones where it's the full band all playing together and overdubs on top. And again, I think that adds to the emotion. There's a tension or there's a conflict. I know that it was a very simply structured um, chord change and that I was experimenting with a little battery-operated fan to play guitar. And uh, that's about all I remember of it. I haven't heard that song for the last 15 years. Yeah, I can't remember. It was difficult at that time, how far, hard on for love. It was more an overdubbing recording. And you never know what time signature that song's in. All you hear is just this aggressive monster railing at you from the speakers and it just picks you up and doesn't let you go. Hard on for love I like now we play with two drums. It's like they're really excited to play these songs. It's like, the, you know, it's almost like a teenage band. <laughs> Listen to this, you fuckers, you know, it's great. She Fell Away, I thought was really just what a great song and the way it rises and falls. You'd never believe that to hear it, but there must have been about a day's worth of versions of that song 
with everybody trying to play it, and it almost sounding a bit like a heavy metal song. But nobody could follow what Nick was doing on the piano. And in the end, uh, we chopped his basic piano arrangement up, copied it, and then Mick pretty much played everything over the top of it. But because it's such a random arrangement, it took him forever to do it. I know I kind of, probably during the 80s, I kept everything going, but um, when it could have quite easily fallen apart, a lot more than it did, um, and even musically at that stage too, that I was kind of uh, burdened with kind of getting everything done, really. And he just got so annoyed that we'd go through and do three or four bars and then he'd just stop with utter frustration. He'd bang the camera down so it was just pointing at his feet. And slowly the control room emptied. And I remember by the time we got to the end of the bass overdub, all that was happening, Mick would stop. There'd just be deathly silence. There was nobody else in the control room. Just this picture of his shoes. And then he'd just go, yep. And I'd go back and know exactly where to take up where we'd uh, left off. And then we'd finish it. And then he came into the control room. And uh, he walked in and he goes, oh, where's everybody gone? I said, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, fine, great, no problem. Where have they all gone? We've gone for lunch or something like that. <laughs> and that would be very typical of uh, the way that a lot of that session was. He shouldered a hell of a lot of responsibility, being uh, an amazing kind of musical cons conspirator and, you know, t to be able to kind of take another person's vision and add the musical colour to it um, through thick and thin. Uh, yeah, hats off to him. Seems like an obvious thing to say, but he's got... Nick Cave has a great singing voice, and I think it's um, particularly um, eloquent on Long Time Man. His voice rises and falls, you know, with the kind of quiet, quiet, quiet um, hiatuses in the song. Uh, you know, and when he says it makes a long time man feel bad, there's a kind of catch in his throat, you know, it makes you f you feel bad. It's the point of the, the emotion when Nick's voice breaks on the top note. And it, it it's something, it's it's the classic thing. Leonard Cohen always had this thing that there there's a crack in the bell. And that there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And it's this crack in his voice. And Nick's voice doesn't quite make the high notes. When Tim Rose sings it, he sings it in this gruff sort of macho Stamp, you know, but like, um, but but Nick's at the top of his register, so so that you have this fragility. It it cracks, and it's it's at exactly that point that it completely draws you in. It's like your heart's been broken at that point. It snaps. It just crackles with grief and pain and energy, and you're sold. You're in it. You have to sing along or get drunk. I think one of the things, one of the underrated qualities about Nick, Nick Cave is because everybody always talks about his seriousness. I mean, there is a humour to his music, but the thing I really like is the bitchiness. And uh, there's a couple of really bitchy songs, and he really he usually sneaks them away as B-sides. And I think he's trying to hide them, like the, the song Scum, which was about um, about a, a, a flatmate he had uh, who was a, 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 journal, a, a music journalist who he hated, and he writes this song where he calls him a chronic masturbator and says all these terrible things. And initially it was given away as a, as a flexi-disc. Scum. <laughs> Scum, as is well known, is about as um, is a as is a riposte uh, to Matt Snow's um, revelation that um, he, above all people, had heard a pre-release tape of the Firstborn is Dead. The other character, a really important character in the story, um, is the press officer. People were growing up mutually, and the journos and musicians were kind of entering periods of trading off one another and people really wanted uh, a piece of Nick and you know his lifestyle you know it's, it's that give me give me danger little stranger. Mute had sent me the an advanced tape of um, the second album Firstborn is Dead um, 
And this I found a, a little disappointing. It just lacked the intensity. Subsequently, actually, I, I like it more. But at the time, after the explosion of the first Bad Seeds album, uh, it, it, the, the, the quality, not quality control, but the degree of intensity, not every song was brilliant. There were, there were patches when it seemed to slacken a little bit. And in that rather um, noble way that NME writers then and possibly since and maybe even before, had or have. Um, I couldn't wait to tell the readers that, that I had the inside track on the new Nick Cave Bad Seeds opus. You could be uh, picked up by one music paper and sort of championed while the others sort of attempt to pick you apart or destroy you. And uh, with that, you know, territory, you, you came against or up against people who I think looking back on it now, it was probably fairly innocent, but at the time, uh, you know, as I say, they wanted a piece of Nick, they wanted a piece of that action. And occasionally uh, boundaries were crossed and scum was a suitable retaliation in one respect. It was, and it is, um... I suppose the most vituperative um, song I've ever heard. Um, that Bob Dylan song, Ballad of a Thin Man, You Don't Know What's Happening, Do You, Mr. Jones, pales by comparison with this song, Scum. Um, uh, and it, I didn't know quite what to feel apart from I thought this is absolutely brilliant. It was so funny. And I did recognize myself in it. Um, and th there were hot flushes of, of self-recognition and embarrassment. Black Snow, Black Snow, you gave me a bad review and stuff. The, ignoring the sentiment behind it or whoever it was aimed at, I mean, I, I know, but as a, just a joyous exercise in what language can do, um, the music is this eccentric, as in a kind of an eccentric rotation, you, the, the bars and the count it lollops along and it's, it's, it's ink come to life. It's, it's text living. And my God, what a great text it is. The vitriol is fantastic. It's so honed and bitter and specific. You're kind of picking the fluff out of your mouth. You're never going to go back there again. And the, you know, the, the assassination at the end. That's an exquisite example of how much fun writing and music can be, I think, for all the anger and venom behind it. If you can express it that way, God, it's fun. It must be fun. I started working with Nick and was interested in continuing working with Nick when I started out even at school because I thought he had a, an enormous potential to write interesting things. You know, it's not like... It's not like Nick's, Nick's writing... Nick, Nick's the first, but he, he's certainly... He has certainly... Um, explored all sorts of levels of he's certainly tested the ability of rock music uh to um i nearly said journalism there rock music to uh express all sorts of human emotions and that's it is constantly surprising to me just how how special his work can be Well, it's all downhill with a bullet. Well, the 
this rambling and roving is taking its cause. I'm grazing with the dinosaurs and the dear old horses, and the city streets crack, and a great hole forces me down my soapbox, my pulpit. Silver star spangled, and the coins in my pocket go jingle. 